to the, um, the scheduled topic for this week, which is the evaluation and management of Alex Valgus. Um, so Alex Valgus, as we all know, is a, a very uh, common uh, condition in our community. <coughs> and the, the common um, demographic for it to appear in is a, a female in her 30s to, to 50s, uh, with it being a 9 to 1 predilection towards the, the female gender. Um, the definition for what constitutes a hallux valgus uh, varies depending on what literature you read, but um, the typical definition is uh, a deviation of the, the phalanx of the hallux of 15 to 20 degrees from the metatarsal, the first metatarsal. Um, and as imaging shows, this is Victoria Beckham, who is most definitely a woman in her 30s to 50s, and, and a close up of her feet provided by the paparazzi <coughs> that day show a, a um, valgus deformity of her great toe with the uh, characteristic pronation. There are <clears throat> some known risk factors for developing hallux valgus. Uh, there is a high incidence of hereditary inheritance and appears to be also dominant, um, with 60% having a, um, a family member with uh, hallux valgus or go on to subsequently develop it. 60% of people who develop hallux valgus have a family member who have it themselves. Um, having rheumatoid arthritis, and there's also been an association with footwear and that was a comparison of the uh, incidence of hallux valgus in unshod um, members of society compared to shod members of society. Uh, there's been another uh, causative factor suggested um, that perhaps the, the initiating factor is in fact the arising of that first metatarsal, uh, there, whereas there are others who would suggest that the initiating factor is in fact lateralisation of the great toe. Um, there's suggestion that the Footwear is the precipitating factor which throws the, the phalanx out. And there's also a suggestion that hypermobility of the joints may contribute um, to this condition. Uh, when considering why this deformity occurs, it's important to consider why uh, the great toe is stable to begin with. And so the, the real prerequisites for having a stable great toe are to have a congruent um, first metatarsophalangeal joint with uh, symmetrical alignment of the phalanx and the head. Um, a strong relationship between the first metatarsal articular surface and its axis, and by that I refer to this articular surface here, um, being angulated, being positioned at a, a, such that it does not cause over valgus angulation of the, the ray, and also balancing of the soft tissues of the head, and also a stable first metatarsal tarsal joint as well. Um, the, I saw a nice line in one of the journal articles which was describing the, the biomechanics and it's not um, and put nicely, it's not completely understood. But here are some of the um, theories for the contributing factors for Alex Valgus. Uh, the first is the suggestion that ground reactive forces play a role. Every time we put our foot down and move through the toe off, we put more on our own body weight of uh, force through the pulp space which sits beneath the metatarsal head of the first ray. And the suggestion of those brown reactive forces can lead directly to attenuation of the medial capsule, which then loosens, uh, allowing the, the, the phalanx to drift into the valgus. <coughs> and there's also a suggestion that um, once there is a, um, an element of valgus deformity, that the, the nature of the anatomy around the area is self-perpetuating. And the, the description here is that once that there is an initiation of the valgus deformity, it then the phalanx then develops a rotational deformity where it, where it goes into pronation, like you can see there. And then you, there's loss of the medial stabilisation. We've talked about attenuation of the medial structures, but in addition, um, a ductor halysis moves from this position here, whereby it acts as a medial stabiliser and moves underneath the, the great toe, um, potentially increasing the valgus force also, there's um, the sesamoid shift out of the crista, uh, losing their ability to hold the, the phalanx in alignment. And also there is a potential, contrib a potential contribution from adductor halysis um, and the other flexors. And the final um, uh, anatomical consideration that I'll throw in there is uh, the, the dorsal um, uh, metatarsal uh, I should read articulate with the DMA. And that was like what I was saying before, in consider considerations for a congruent joint, if that um, distal metatarsal articular surface is already 
pointing the phalanx into valves, as a suggestion that that would uh, further potentiate the deformity. Um, the head shape, uh, a squared off head providing more stability or a very round smooth surface allowing the, the toe to drift into valgus. Hypermobility I've discussed also uh, previously. And pes planus, uh, the idea being that having flat feet will have, would increase the weight bearing forces through that, um, that medial capsule causing attenuation and then allow it to drift into valgus and pronation. As a result, um, the weight bearing, uh, the weight bearing capacity of the first metatarsal is decreased, and that the increase, there is increase of weight bearing across the other uh, metatarsal heads, leading to a transfer metatarsalgia. Um, there are soft tissue changes forming over that thin glabrous skin over the toes, leading to corns, and there's also the development of the bunion uh, over that medial eminence of the first metatarsal. Um, subsequent toe deformities can occur, such as a, a hammer toe of the second toe. Um, often due to overcrowding of the toes within a shoe. Um, this all leads to difficulty with weight bearing for severe cases and um, put simply difficulty wearing narrow shoes for less severe cases. The end stage for this can be arthritis of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So in assessing them, it's essential to take a history from a patient, obviously things such as the time course and the impact on their function and day-to-day -day life is very important. And also identify their patient concern. What particularly is their greatest problem? Is it recurrent infections from ulcers? Is it the cosmetic appearance? Or is it um, an interruption to their day-to-day -day life? Um, characters lead up to complain of pain and swelling over the first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint. And also difficulty fitting into shoes. So on examination, in addition to your regular foot and ankle examination, I'll point out some of the more salient features. Uh, it's important that you do consider uh, the wear patterns on the bottom of the shoes, um, looking for lateral loading as, as patients put less weight through that um, through the hallux. Um, patients' weight-bearing um, patterns of their foot, watching the way that they walk and seeing whether they're loading down the edge of their foot or whether they're going through to a normal toe-off and taking off through the hallux. Um, the development of plantar callosities over the lesser toes is a common fe is a feature of hallux, hallux valgus. And it's important to consider the range of motion of that toe and look for other deformities such as the hammer toe, the second toe, which you can see here. Other considerations are the presence of ankle equinus, um, which could throw the foot into, uh, which change the weight bearing dynamics of the foot. Presence of ingrown toenails and a pronated foot. Um, eventually, some of these patients will go on to opt may go into operative treatment and so a careful neurovascular examination to establish the status is important and um, with regards to special tests, a squeeze across the metatarsal heads may be positive for a, uh, a mortis neuroma, a differential for the... <coughs> Weight bearing imaging of the foot is important and the typical views are a dorsal plantar, a lateral oblique. Um, other views include a, a sesamoid view, although I struggle to find the imaging to demonstrate this. Uh, when looking at the plane views, the, the things to look for are decreases in the joint space and the, the metatarsal phalangeal joint, as well as features of osteoarthritis. You need to make an assessment as to whether the, that first joint is indeed congruent or whether there is subluxation of the phallus on the metatarsal head. Um, uh, you need to make note of how prominent the first metatarsal head is medially and what is the relative position of the cisloids and how uncovered they are. There are some angles which are used um, commonly uh, for the stratification of the severity of hallux valgus, and I'll go through these. In addition to the three I've listed there, there's at least two others which I've um, left off because they seem to be less pertinent to the stratification. So the first is the, the hallux valgus angle, and it's uh, suggested that anything greater than 10 to 15 degrees is um, pathological. So this poor patient has an angulation of 44 degrees. The intermetatarsal uh, angle, so establishing the amount of varus that, that first metatarsal has been thrown into, and anything greater than 8 or 9 degrees here is considered pathological. An assessment can also be made of the, the angulation of the metatarsal um, articular surface, um, and that is by drawing a line across the two edges of the articular surface as perceived on the X-ray and comparing that to the normal of the shaft of the... Um, that first metatarsal. Um, 
the intra-observer reliability of measuring this angle is low, um, although it does frequently occur in, um, in treatment algorithms. So having a senior patient and uh, having good appearance on x-ray, it's important to uh, slot them into um, uh, some sort of uh, staging system. Uh, the MAN classification is uh, one of the ones that I came across common, commonly in the literature. But there are a number of others that are often published in review articles, each with their own variation, which weren't referenced. But essentially, they, they look at the same features, the congruency of the joint, the presence of degenerative disease, and then stratify them depending on how much deformity there is, how much of the sesamoids are uncovered, although the numbers do change subtly with each staging system. With, as with most injury uh, conditions in orthopaedics, it all begins with non-operative management. And I think it's it seems to be that it's important that we uh, first figure out exactly what it is that the patient is, uh, patient's greatest problem is. Um, is it a cosmetic deformity? Is it pain that limits their uh, their day-to-day -day life? Or is it uh, the inability to wear the shoes that they'd like to wear? Um, patient education is very uh, helpful. Um, it's worthwhile uh, discussing with them. This is a generally a progressive condition and watch and wait, fail, uh, watch and wait treatment may not be successful. Um, however, operative management can be staved off with adequate uh, non-operative measures. These include uh, use of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, to help with pain and footwear modifications such as um, changing footwear usage from uh, high heels or um, poorly supportive footwear into something that is more supportive, the box toe, to create space around the deformed toes. Um, medial eminence padding is another option to, um, to take the pressure off that painful medial eminence. And also the provision of an orthotic, um, some patients find helpful. I mentioned a moment ago that there's a number of treatment algorithms for this. And essentially what, you, what it comes down to is stratifying where your patient sits in the, uh, the disease spectrum. Uh, this one is one that I've taken uh, from Miller's Orthopaedic Review. Uh, this is another one that was from an um, accredited uh, trainee's handout. I, don't, I can't find the, um, the reference for this, I'm afraid. Um, but essentially, with progressive deformity um, comes progressive uh, surgical considerations and um, more advanced procedures such as performing arthrodesis as opposed to um, osteotomies to realign the joint. Um, all of these, one of the common themes of all of these is some form of soft tissue balancing. Um, in addition to using an algorithm, there are authors who would suggest that the, the best thing to do is to have a careful review of your patient's main problem, the main foot deformity, <coughs> and tailor your operation to suit their particular foot. <coughs> I'll, I'll briefly run over some of the common procedures. Uh, a bunionectomy um, is a straightforward procedure where using a medial incision you take off the, the medial prominence using an osteotome and also perform some sort of uh, plication of the medial capsule. Um, my reading indicates that there's high levels of recurrence of the deformity and poor patient satisfaction with this procedure, although it is an option for um, uh, low demand patients and patients who want minimal, uh, minimal invas invasive surgical treatment. Uh, chevron osteotomy is one of the distal osteotomies and you form a V-shaped cut through the distal metatarsal and slide um, the articular surface across. This can be uh, incorporated with a, a lateral release of the lateral structures around the joint. And you may also include an Aiken procedure, uh, which is a, a closing wedge osteotomy of the proximal phalanx to realign the first ray. One of the problems with the chevron osteotomy is that is the interruption of the blood supply to the head, which can lead to avascular necrosis. Um, a Keller's resection arthroplasty is another commonly performed procedure. And this, in this situation, you have a resection of the proximal phalanx base. Um, you may uh, wish to perform um, a sesamoidectomy of the lateral sesamoid, um, although its role is says that its role is limited. Um, perhaps a better operation for older patients who have limited expectations and are poor candidates for uh, more invasive corrective surgery. Um, one of the more common, commonly performed procedures is the scarf osteotomy. 
and this is for moderate to severe disease. Um, and here you make uh, three cuts through the, the metatarsal uh, to create a distal dorsal limb, a proximal parietal limb with a transverse cut. And then you can reorientate the di direction of the, the first metatarsal. Um, this is a, a more well validated procedure in the literature and uh, with good evidence of radiographic correction on your post operative x ray and a suggestion that there may be um, better weight distribution. Uh, one of the complications that can be seen with the scarf osteotomy is troughing of the, um, around, the, in, around the limbs, which can lead to overall shortening of the metatarsal. Um, so just to wrap up um, hallux valgus, it's a, it's a common condition for which non-operative management has a very important initial role, um, and surgery can be performed to the selected patients. And uh, the approach to choosing an operation for a patient um, might be algorithmic, or uh, you can tailor a specific operation based on the patient's own deformity. I'll keep on going to hallux rigidus now. Um, so this is the second most common hallux pathology, and is the most common form of degenerative joint disease in the foot. Uh, the natural history of hallux uh, rigidus is somewhat different than that of hallux valgus, and for some people um, it's an incidental finding um, and once established may not progress, although for others it is slightly progressive and can be a cause of disability. Here we have, um, more straightforward, you have damage to the articular surface, which then leads to restriction of uh, dorsiflexion. There are, a couple of, there are some suggestions to why this occurs. Occurs. A long uh, first metatarsal ray may lead to increased stress through that joint and early uh, degenerative changes. Or a, <clears throat> a high first metatarsal ray may put the phalanx into flexion and cause uh, constriction of, of the, the capsule on the plantar side. Um, there are other putative mechanisms uh, going around in the literature, such as hypermobility, pronation, um, co concurrent hallux valgus and metatarsus abductus, although um, causal links have yet to be established from my reading. So again, um, any good clinical evaluation begins with the history and, and these patients will complain more so of uh, dorsal pain and swelling of the foot um, and especially with difficulty walking over rough or uneven surfaces. The salient features on examination here are again <coughs> lateral loading during the, the stance phase of gait, uh, a straight hallux uh, when viewed in the dorsal plantar plane, um, uh, the, the, pro the presence of a dorsal bunion, which um, the, the, clinical, the clinical textbook suggests is pathognomonic for the condition, and also restricted dorsiflexion. So you can hear, see here someone is trying to uh, dorsiflex the hallux, but they can't really get beyond approximately 10 degrees. Again, imaging with plain films is where we begin, and the, the salient features are osteoarthritis at the first joint. A squared uh, metatarsal head is a radiographic feature, and the do as is the dorsal osteophyte. Um, again, non-operative management is where we start, and for some people it was where we'll, where we'll stop as well. So provision of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, intra-articular uh, cortisone and anaesthetic mixture um, has a role to play. Changing the patient's lifestyle modifications, such as a rocker bottom shoe, to take the pressure off the hallux during the toe-off um, uh, phase of gait, and also elevating the metatarsal head um, to allow more flexion using a metatarsal bar on an insole. Um, operative procedures for this condition a chelectomy where you take the dorsal third of the articular surface, you lose bodies or dorsal osteophytes, you can perform um, a cyanovectomy, and this is, leads to, unlike a, a bunionectomy, this actually leads good, to good results for early disease, although uh, osteophyte recurrence can occur in 30%. Um, again, callus resection arthroplasty of the proximal phalanx is an option, and you can get good results in low demand patients. Although in hallux rigidus, it seems that it can, it can also contribute to a transfer, transfer metatarsalgia. Um, arthrodesis is an option for advanced patients' disease. Um, the union rates reported in the literature vary between 90 to 100%. And the position that one would um, uh, fuse a joint in is 10 degrees of valgus with 10 to 15 degrees of flexion. 
uh, to allow the patient to roll through to toe up and stance. Arthroplasty is also um, discussed and a few different options with not terrific results. Insertion of a sciolastic implant. Uh, these are generally failed because the implant is fractured or worn away too quickly and um, there are ongoing concerns for debris, even with the next generation of, um, of material. Uh, metallic total uh, joint arthroplasty has had poor results with um, high proportionally becoming loose Shifting into varus or valgus, or having evidence of lucency on x rays. Uh, hemiarthroplasty just performed on the metatarsal side um, has led to better results, it seems, although numbers are small at this stage. Um, so, to summarise the management of um, hallux rigidus, it's a common condition, uh, may be successfully managed <coughs> non-operatively. There are a range of procedures that can be performed for those that are resilient to non-operative management, um, yet, the, the role of arthroplasty is yet to be defined. These are the references that I've used. Um, any questions?